foreign object can be removed and small cuts which have not injured the casing can be cleaned out and then repaired by cementing tire filler in the cut. When removing airplane tires, make sure the jacks are handled properly and that the tires are protected from oil and hydraulic fluid by canvas covers. Whenever possible, tires should be serviced by men trained for this work in a place equipped for tire servicing, where the floor can be kept clean and there are enough tools and permanent equipment to do the job quickly and thoroughly without exposing the tire and rims unduly to accidental injury in making the change. The first step in dismounting the tire is to remove the cap from the valve stem and then remove the valve core. This is a large non-skid airplane tire mounted on a flat base wheel. The cap and valve core are laid aside in a clean spot where they will not be fouled with dirt. After the tube has been deflated, the lock nut is removed. Then the tire is laid on its side with the fixed flange down. The hardest part of dismounting a tire is loosening the beads from the rim flanges. This can be done in several ways. One way to loosen the bead is by use of the Kennedy tire tools, which work on a simple leverage principle. Now, one end of the locking ring is pried free with the claw end of the Kennedy iron or any other handy tool. Then with the hands, the locking ring is worked up out of its slot and set aside. With a short-handled heavy hammer, the straight unit of the Kennedy iron is driven between the bead and the flange with the slotted side up. The tool is started at about a 20 degree angle. While driving it under the bead, a downward pressure is maintained until finally it lies flat against the tire. On large heavy tires, it is necessary to insert a second Kennedy tool about six inches away from the first one. The claw unit of the Kennedy tool is inserted under the rim flange so that it engages the straight tool. Position is taken to use knee leverage to lift up on the straight tool at the same time the claw tool is pulled down. Loosening the tire bead with two Kennedy irons is made easy by teamwork. The demountable flange may now be lifted off and set aside out of the way. The tire is next turned over so the other bead may be loosened. It should be handled carefully so that there is no danger of damaging the wheel by letting it fall. Two sets of Kennedy irons are again used to loosen the bead. Teamwork makes it easy. Under field conditions, several men can lift the wheel out of the tire, but wherever and whenever possible, it is simpler to use a hoist. After the wheel has been lifted out by the hoist, it is lowered out of the way. 
the tire is then stood up. Enough air always remains in the tube to make its removal difficult. But with the tire standing up so that one man can push while the other two pull, the tube can be removed. Another picture covers detailed inspection and repair. Since this tire has a flat spot large enough to throw the tire out of balance, it will be set aside for treading and replaced by a new tire. Before being mounted, all casings, whether new or used, are carefully inspected. The inside of the casing is thoroughly cleaned out. Someone might have tampered with a new casing or it might have foreign objects on the inside. It should be as carefully inspected as a used casing. The surface of any tube, new or used, except dual seal tubes, is cleaned, inspected, and dusted lightly with talc. And then the core inserted in the valve stem The tube is now ready to be put in the casing. With the balance mark on the tube matched with the balanced mark on the casing, the tube is inserted valve section first. Care is taken to see that the balance marks are together. Otherwise, the tire assembly will be out of balance. After the tube has been inflated until it fits snugly, the balance marks are checked for alignment. More air is added until the tire and tube are firm and the tube fits so tightly it will not slip around in the casing. The wheel is lowered and worked into the tire. The valve hole and the valve stem are lined up so that the valve stem will fit into the valve hole in the wheel. Now the hoist is released and the wheel is turned over. It is lifted at the valve. One man holds the wheel so that it will not fall out as the assembly is lowered. The demountable flange is put on next in its correct position. The locking ring is put on and seated properly. If this ring is not seated firmly, it might fly off when the tire is inflated. A mallet is used to tap it securely in place. The tire is stood up so that a valve extension may be fastened to the valve stem in the valve hole. A screwdriver may be necessary to push the valve stem into position so the extension can be attached.
The tire is kept in this upright position and inflated slowly until the beads are seated. In this position there is no strain on the valve. Checks during the inflation will make sure the valve stem is not binding. As the tube forces the beads against the rim flanges, the tube may buckle and wrinkle. The extension is removed. The lock nut is put back on the valve stem. Then the valve core is removed and the tire deflated. This gives the tube a chance to smooth out in the casing. The valve core is replaced and the tire is reinflated to approximately the pressure at which it will operate on the airplane. Tire pressures will be discussed in detail later. The valve cap is replaced and the tire is now ready to be put back on the airplane. While the permanently installed mounting jig cannot be used to loosen the beads on tires with a demountable flange, it can be used to dismount and mount tires on other wheel types. The jig may be used to dismount and mount tires such as this 36 inch tire mounted on a drop center wheel. The valve stem, lock nut and the valve core are removed and laid aside. And the proper size bearing adapter is placed over the jig spindle. The tire assembly is now lifted up and lowered over the jig spindle. A top bearing adapter is placed over the jig spindle and fitted into the wheel hub to hold the wheel rigid. A pressure ring of the proper size is put in place. Then the spider is lowered over the spindle to rest on the pressure ring. A spindle nut is screwed down against the spider and tightened until the pressure ring forces the bead away from the rim flange. Next, the spindle nut, spider, pressure ring, and bearing adapter are removed. The tire assembly is turned over on the jig. Then the bearing adapter, pressure ring, spider, and spindle nut are again put in place. The second bead is loosened exactly as the first was loosened. Then the spindle nut, spider, and pressure ring are removed. The spindle is turned down until it is out of the way so the tire irons may be used freely. Then the spindle nut is screwed down tight on the top bearing adapter to hold the wheel rigid. After the valve stem has been pushed through the valve hole, the beads are forced into the well of the drop center rim. Starting at the valve section, two tire irons are inserted under the toe of the bead. The bead is forced up over the rim flange by prying up with both tire irons.
With one tire iron held in place, the remainder of the bead is pried up over the rim flange with the other tire iron. This is done in short, progressive steps. In this operation, care must be taken not to injure the bead, the tube, or the rim. The tire irons must be properly handled. This can be made clear by an animated drawing featuring a cross section of the tire which shows the beads in the well of the drop center rim. Correctly inserted, the tip of the tire iron fits under and slightly beyond the toe of the bead. With the tire iron in this position, the bead can be lifted over the rim flange without damage to the tire tube, or rim. If not inserted far enough, the tire iron can bite into the bead, and ruin the tire. Or if inserted too far past the toe of the bead, the tire iron can pinch and ruin the tube. With the upper bead held out of the way with a hoist, the tube is pulled out of the casing valve section first. It is now a simple matter to pry the lower bead up over the rim flange. Using the jig to mount a tire on a drop center wheel, the lower bead is first worked over the flange with the tire irons and dropped into the well. The tube is inserted and the balance markers are matched. After the valve stem has been pulled through the valve hole and secured, the bead is worked over the rim flange with the tire irons, starting opposite the valve. When the tire has been inflated, the beads are inspected to be sure they are properly seated. Then the tire is deflated to let the tube adjust itself before it is inflated to service pressure. Dismounting and mounting a nose wheel tire with a dual seal tube present a different problem. The dual seal tube has an outer and an inner air compartment. When the tire is inflated, both compartments carry the same air pressure. Then the valve core housing with its tapered rubber washer is screwed down tight and seated firmly. This seals the air in the inner compartment away from the outer compartment. If the tire is punctured or blows out on landing, the air sealed in the inner compartment keeps the tire from collapsing and prevents it from balling up and sticking in the nose wheel fork. To deflate the tire for dismounting, first remove the valve core. Then the core housing is unscrewed five full turns. This lets the air escape from both compartments at the same time. If the valve core housing is removed before the tube is deflated, air from the inner compartment will escape too rapidly and seal the air in the outer compartment. When the tube has been fully deflated, the core housing is removed. To dismount the tire on the jig, the bead is forced up over the rim flange as already outlined. But to pull the dual seal tube out of the casing, a strap attached to a hoist is used. Because of its heavy construction, the tube is very hard to remove with just hand power. Because the tube in a nose wheel tire has a tendency to slip around in the casing, the casing must be wiped absolutely clean with a cloth dampened with gasoline. Then the inside of the casing is dried thoroughly with the air hose. The tube is cleaned in the same manner. Both the tube and the casing 
must be dry before mounting. The dual seal tube is laid inside the nose wheel casing and the balance markers are lined up. Then the core housing is removed to prevent damage when the tube is forced over the rim flange. The core housing is replaced and the valve extension is attached. With the extension removed, the tire is ready to be inflated. The core housing is unscrewed five turns and the tube is inflated until the beads are seated. Deflate by removing the valve core. This allows the tube to adjust itself in the casing. The tire is now inflated to the desired pressure. After a 30 second wait to allow the pressure to equalize in both air compartments, the core housing is screwed down tight. With the valve core removed, a spit test is made to check for leakage. If no leakage is discovered, the valve core is put back. Because of the tendency of dual seal tubes in nose wheel tires to slip, they must be inflated to the required pressure and kept at this pressure by frequent inflation checks. The method of checking the inflation of nose wheel tires will be explained in another picture. When removing the tube from a 1250 tail